So in this series, we've started to learn how to write Python. We've learned about all the fundamentals. We've taken a look at how to read and write data to files. We worked with popular data structures such as JSON. And in the previous video, we've built our first HTTP microservice, which serves customer data over a web endpoint. Our first application is a Flask web server that exposes an endpoint to get customers, get a single customer, update a customer, and our app stores customer data in a JSON file. Now, when applications store data in files, there are several disadvantages. If we run multiple instances of our application, each application would have its own file. So when we load balance these instances and a request to update a customer comes to one of the instances, that update will be missing on the other instance. So this means our application is not scalable. If we let all of the instances write to the same file, there may be concurrency issues when two instances are writing at the same time and that can end up corrupting the file and we can lose data. This is where databases come in. In this video we'll take a look at Redis. Databases allow for concurrency so if we scale our app they can all connect to the same database. Databases are also highly available as you can replicate multiple instances. Databases allow us to keep our data outside of our application, so our application can restart without losing its data. And this makes our application stateless. Now today we're going to be writing some code to connect our application to a database. And we'll take a look at the important parts of connecting our application to a database. So without further ado, let's go. So if we take a look at my GitHub repo, I have a Python folder and in the Python folder I have an introduction folder with a readme. And this is our introduction to Python. We learn how to run Python in a Docker container, we build our first program and we learn about the fundamentals of Python. If you're new to Python, check out the link down below to part one of the series. Then if we take a look at the Python introduction part two folder, we have another readme which talks about the introduction to reading and writing files. This is an important fundamental of Python because it's very common to read and write to files. Then we have the part three folder, which has another readme which talks about the introduction to Python and dealing with JSON data structures. JSON is very important, especially in microservices as it's a very common form of payload. It's generally the way microservices talk to one another. And then finally in part four, we've got another readme where we've taken a look at putting all of this together by building our first HTTP microservice that exposes an endpoint to read and write customer data to file. In this video, we're gonna be taking a look at part five, which is in the database Redis folder. And we have another readme. And this readme is all about storing our data in a database. So we're gonna be taking a look at setting up a Redis cluster. We're gonna start our Python dev environment in a Docker container, look at our application and connect it up to Redis. So be sure to check out the link down below to the source code so you can follow along. So let's start by setting up a Redis cluster. If you're new to Redis, I've made a series about the basics of Redis, which you can find down below. I've got a link to a document right over here, which will give us some basic instructions of starting up three Redis instances, as well as three Sentinel instances, which will help us make our cluster highly available. Now, if we take a look at my GitHub repo, I have a storage folder and in there I have a Redis folder with a readme. This is the readme guide for my entire Redis series where we take a look at running Redis in a Docker container, how to configure it. We also take a look at clustering, setting up a highly available Redis cluster. And then we finally take a look at how to run Redis on Kubernetes. But in our example, we're just going to take a look at the clustering folder and the readme, which gives us the command for setting up a Redis cluster. So what I'm going to do is change directory to the storage Redis clustering folder. We're going to change directory to that. And if we take a look at that directory, 
directory, we have three Redis folders, one for each instance, and we have a Redis configuration for each instance. And then we also have three folders, one for each Sentinel and a Sentinel configuration. I'm gonna start up a Docker network where I'm gonna run all my Redis containers on so they can talk to each other. I'm gonna do that by saying Docker network create Redis. Go ahead and copy that to the terminal and that will create our Redis network. Then I'm gonna start up each of my Redis instances with a Docker command. I'm gonna say docker run minus D to run in background mode, dash dash RM to remove the container when it's done, dash dash name to give it a name. I'm gonna call this one Redis zero, and then I'm gonna run it on the Redis network. I'm gonna mount in this local Redis zero folder that we see on the left, and I'm gonna mount it into the place where Redis expects the config, which is etc Redis. And then I'm going to run Redis 6.0, the Alpine flavor, which is very lightweight. And I'm going to start up Redis service and point it to that configuration file. Go ahead and copy this command, paste it to the terminal, and that'll start up our Redis instance. I'm going to go ahead and run the same command, but this time I'm going to run Redis 1. And I'm going to mount in the Redis 1 configuration, paste that to the terminal, and then finally do the same thing for Redis 2 and paste that to the terminal. And then if I do docker ps, we can see we have our three Redis instances running. Now to form a Redis cluster, we have to run three instances of the Sentinel service. The Sentinels is what makes Redis highly available. It plays the role of leader election. When one of the masters dies, the Sentinels will choose a new master. The Sentinels will also help us discover the latest master. So our application will use the Sentinel to be able to figure out which master to talk to. Now, if I scroll down in this readme file, we'll see the commands for running the Sentinels. So there are another three Docker run commands, but this time we're gonna be saying Docker run minus D. We're gonna call our container Sentinel-0, run it on the Redis network, but this time we're gonna mount in the Sentinel configuration to the etc redis folder and then we're going to start up our redis sentinel by passing in the config so i go ahead and paste that to the terminal and that will start up our redis instance i do the same thing for sentinel one and I do the same thing for Sentinel 2. So now if I do Docker PS, we should see six containers up and running, three Redis instances and three Sentinels. So now that we have our Redis instances up and running, let's go ahead and set up our Python development environment in a Docker container. Now, if we take a look at our readme and we scroll a little bit down, we've got the section that shows how to set up our Python dev environment. Now in this entire series, we've been using Docker to set up our Python environment. And the reason for that is Docker makes our environment highly portable. This means we can work on multiple different microservices and applications with different versions of Python because we don't have to worry about having different versions of Python installed locally. We can install all our dependencies inside an immutable container that we can throw away once we're done. So all things start with a Docker file. So what we're going to do is in our Python part five Redis folder, we're gonna create a new file called a Docker file. And in this Docker file, what we're gonna do is say from Python and we're gonna run Python 3.9.6. And we're also gonna run it on a lightweight Alpine container. And we're gonna call this layer dev and we're gonna set our work directory to slash work. So this is the folder where we will be doing all our work. So that's a very simple two line Docker file. Now to build this container, all I have to do is change directory to the Python introduction part five folder. Go ahead and change directory. If I do LS, we can see our Docker file is in here. And I'm gonna build this Docker file by saying Docker build. I'm gonna build the dev target, which is the only target we currently have in our image. I'm gonna say dot because that's the local folder where the Docker file is located. And I'm gonna tag this image as Python. So I go ahead and run that and that will build up our small container image. Now to run that container, it's very simple. I just say docker run minus it. I'm gonna mount my local folder into that working directory that we specified. So that means all my source code that I write locally in VS code will be accessible in the container. I'm gonna expose port 5000 because that is our port that our web server will be listening on. I'm gonna run this application on the Redis network so it can talk to Redis. And I'm gonna specify Python, which is the image we've 
we've just built. And I'm also going to say I want to access SH, which is a shell terminal inside of the container. So when we go ahead and run this command, you'll notice that we will get a terminal. We are now inside of the container. If I do LS minus L, we can see the readme as well as the Docker file on the left here. So we now have access to our source code inside the container. I can also say Python dash dash version, and we can see we now have access to Python inside of the container as well without needing Python on our local machine. So now we have our dev environment ready to go, which is highly portable running in a lightweight Docker container. So now we're going to go ahead and create our customer app which allows us to access customer inventory data over a web endpoint. And it also allows us to update the data over a web endpoint. So our application has a bunch of functions that deals with customer data. Let's go ahead and summarize it. So now we're going to take what we've learned in part one, two, and three and build up our customer app. So the first thing we're going to do is define a bunch of imports. Firstly, we need os.path to deal with files. We're going to import CSV and JSON to deal with data structures. We're going to import Flask because we want to run a Flask web server and request because we're going to want to deal with HTTP requests. And to create our application, what I'm going to do is in our part five folder, I'm going to create a new folder called SRC, which is our source code folder which holds all the source code separate from our docker file and infrastructure as code so in the source folder i'm going to right click create a new file called app.py and i'm going to paste those import statements into my app.py file then we're going to go ahead and define what a customer looks like by defining a customer object so we create this class called customer which has a constructor that passes in the different fields to instantiate and initialize a customer so customer has three fields on it, a customer ID, a first name and a last name. And we also looked at functions in part one, which is how to write a, a function, attach a function to our class to get the full name, which simply computes the full name by taking the full name, adding a space and the last name. So this is what a customer object looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this and paste it into our app.py file. So now we have a customer definition over here and next up we want a global variable which is called data path which tells the application where the customer file is located where we will read and write customer data to so at the top here i'm just going to go ahead and set that variable and we'll pull in this file in a bit then we're going to need a function that reads that file and returns our customers so in part one we've taken a look at functions so we've learned how to define a function and we're going to define a function called get customers We've taken a look at how to read and write files. So we're going to say os.path. We're first going to check if the file is there. And if it is there, we're going to go ahead and open it. And then we're going to read the file content by saying customerfiles.read. And we're going to load all the JSON data into a customer's dictionary. And we're going to go ahead and return that. And if the file doesn't exist, we have an else statement, which just returns an empty value. So go ahead and just below our customer class, we're going to add that get customers function. So this is the function that returns all customers in the file. Next up, we're going to create another function which simply returns one single customer by ID. So that's very simple. We create a new function called get customer without the S. We take some input, which is the customer ID. And what we're going to do here is simply return all the customers into a dictionary. And then we're we're going to say if the customer ID is in that customers, go ahead and access that dictionary value and return it. Otherwise, just return an empty customer. So go ahead and copy this function to our file. Now we have a function to return all customers and get a single customer. And finally, we need a function to update our customers. So what we do here is create a new function called update customers, where we take in a dictionary of existing customers. We go ahead and open our file and note that we use w mode which is write mode we go ahead and take our customers dictionary and convert it to a json string by calling the json.dumps function that's going to give us the json which we can then write to our file
file by saying customer file dot write and passing the JSON string. So this will take the customer dictionary and write it to a file. So I'm going to go ahead and paste that function. And now we have an update customers function. Now in our previous episodes, when looking at reading and writing files, we created this customers dot JSON file. So let's go ahead and create that file. So in the source folder, I'm going to right click say new file customers dot JSON. And I have an example here of what a dictionary of customers look like where the ID of the dictionary items is the customer ID. And then we have the customer object. You can see I have customer ID, the first name and the last name. And this is the list of all our legendary customers. So I go ahead and copy this to the file. And now we have our customers file ready to go. So now we have our functions that deal with the customer data and we have the data living in a file. Now to expose these functions, we're going to create a web application. This is where Flask comes in. We're going to install Flask and then set up a few endpoints to be able to read and write customer data to the file. Now to set up our Flask application, what we're going to do is create a new variable called app and we're going to go ahead and instantiate our Flask server. And then we're going to define a couple of routes. The first route is just going to be an HTTP get route. So if we take a look at that, it's going to be the root endpoint. It's going to support methods get and it's going to initiate a function called get underscore customers, which is internally simply going to call our get customers function we defined up here and it's going to grab the dictionary from the file and convert it to a JSON string and return it. And then we're going to go ahead and define another route, which is basically to get customer by ID. So you can see we're going to have an endpoint called slash get slash customer ID. And this is also going to be a get method endpoint. And this endpoint is going to initiate an, a function called get underscore customer. It's going to get a customer ID from the URL parameter and it's going to use that to call our internal get customer function that we defined up here, which takes in the customer ID and it's going to return the customer object. If the customer object is blank, we're going to return a status code 404, else we're simply going to return the customer. So that is two simple routes, one to get all customers and one to get a specific customer. Then finally, we're going to want to add a final route, which is to update our customers. So that's very simple. In that example, I'm going to create a new endpoint called slash set which takes in a customer object as a post so for that one we're going to execute a new function called add customer and what that's going to do is it's going to get the customer object from the request body so in order to do that what we're going to say is json equals request.json and that'll grab the json data and then what we're going to do is run some simple validation checks on that json data so what we're going to do is say if the customer id is not in the data return a 400 bad request and and say that the customer ID is required. And in this example, I'm just going to make all fields mandatory. So I'm going to say if first name not in the data, I'm going to say that first name is required. And I'm going to do the same for last name. So this forces the client to post all three fields to our endpoint. And then I'm going to go ahead and update our customers by first grabbing all the customers and then adding or updating the customer's dictionary by accessing the value inside and passing in in our customer. So to do that, I'm going to say customers open close square brackets, and I'm going to pass in the customer ID to access the object inside the customer's dictionary. If it doesn't exist, it's going to create it. Otherwise, it's, it will update it. And then I'm going to set this to a new customer. And inside this customer object, we have to pass in all our fields. So I'm going to pass in firstly the customer ID by saying JSON data open close square brackets and the customer ID. So that's accessing the object that was posted to us by the client. Then I'm going to say comma and I'm going to paste in the first name and comma last name. And then once I've created this new customer object, I'm going to convert it to a dictionary by calling the built in dictionary field. And now our customer's dictionary is updated with the new customer or it would have updated the existing customer. So now what I'm going to do is update that customer's JSON by calling our update function that we've defined find all the way up here. And I'm going to pass in this customer's dictionary and this will go ahead 
and write the updated list to the file. And then when that's done, it's going to return a success message with a status code 200, which indicates a successful update. Now, before we can go ahead and build this application, we need Flask installed in our container environment. So to do that, what we're going to do is import our Flask dependency like we did in our Python HTTP video. And we did this by creating a requirements.txt file that has the content of Flask inside. So we can run pip install to install Flask. So to define our dependencies, what I'm going to do is create a new file in our Redis folder called requirements.txt. And in this file, I'm going to say I want Flask 2.0.2. This allows you to pin the versions of your dependencies, which is very important when dealing with microservice development. Now we can go ahead and install our dependencies by saying pip install. So I'm going to say pip install and then point it to our requirements.txt file. Go ahead and run that and you can see it's gone ahead and installed Flask. Now to test our application, it's very simple. What we need to do is expose a Flask app variable, tell it where our application lives. And then you can see it lives in the source folder. So we go ahead and set that Flask variable. And then we run our application by saying Flask run. We're going to bind it to 0.0.0, .0 and we're going to run it on port 5000. Go ahead and run that. You can see that started up our application. And now you can see we can access our application in the browser, which will call the get endpoint and return all our customers. In a previous episode, we've taken a look at the popular Python package manager called pip which we use to download our dependencies. In this video, we'll need a dependency called Redis PY, which is a client library for Redis. When coding an application that needs access to a database, you need to use a library to create a client for that database. The client takes in a connection string and a password in order to talk to the database. It then manages the connections as well. Now, many folks get this part wrong. Every database type has its own means of high availability. Redis uses a concept of sentinels. So when we create a client and create a connection to a Redis master, we use the sentinels to get the address of the master. When that master instance dies and a failover happens, the sentinels are responsible for leader election. They will choose a new master and our database client in our application will call the sentinel to get the address of the new master instance. So when dealing with Redis, it's very important to get a library that has sentinel support. This means in the case of of Redis failure, our application can get the new address of the master and perform a retry. So our application can recover from failure. So to install this Redis library, we're going to use pip. And to connect to Redis, we're going to use Redis PY, which you can find over here. This Redis PY library is on GitHub, so you can take a look at the documentation. We install this library by simply running pip install Redis, or we can add it to our requirements.txt file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my requirements.txt where I have the Flask dependency, and I'm going to paste the Redis dependency in there as well. So I want Redis 3.5.3. And then I'm going to run pip install and install those dependencies. You can also find the documentation on the pip website. So you can see here I've read us 3.5.3. It shows us the installation guide, the getting started guide. You can see this is how you create a simple connection to Redis. This is how you set a value. This is how you get a value. So very, very straightforward. But more importantly, we need to scroll down and take a look at the Sentinel support part of the guide. And this shows us how to import the Sentinel support library. So we can import that library then we create a client that establishes a connection to a sentinel you can see we pass in a sentinel address and we say discover which will now discover the master that sentinel library will return the address and the port of the current master and it also has a mechanism of discovering slaves if your application wanted to read from slaves and write to a master now if you've been following any of my other programming guides like go you notice that we have to compile an application every time we want to test something. The beauty about Python is that it's a scripting language, so you can run each line without compiling the application. So let's go ahead and play with the Redis Sentinel library. Hey. 
Now remember when we take a look at our containers by running Docker PS, we have three Redis instances and three Sentinels. So what we're going to do is connect to the Sentinels and discover the master and then establish a connection to that master. Then we can go ahead and delete that master, re-query the Sentinels and get the new address. So we're going to go ahead and simulate that. So I'm going to change terminal and jump back into my Docker container for my Python environment. I'm going to type Python, which will go into Python. Then as the example demonstrates, I'm going to say from redis.sentinel and I'm going to import the sentinel library. Once I've done that, I can establish connection to the sentinel by creating a sentinel client. I say sentinel equals and I open close brackets sentinel and I pass in an array of sentinel addresses and a socket timeout. So you can see here I'm telling the Python library that I have sentinel 0, 1 and 2 and the port to connect to. I go ahead and run that. That'll create a new client. Now we can go ahead and query the sentinel for the master by saying sentinel.discoverMaster and the name of the master. And we can see here is the address of our current master. So it returns an IP address. Similarly, we can go ahead and discover the slaves and we can see that we have two slave instances. Now the sentinel also allows us to create a client for that master by saying sentinel.master4, passing the name of the master and the password. So the credentials to connect. If I do that, we now have a master client that allows us to connect connect to that master. We can similarly create a client for the slaves if we wanted to read data. So we can say slave equals sentinel.slave4, pass in the master and the credentials, and that'll give us a slave library. We can then go ahead and set a value in the master by saying master.set. That will write a value to Redis because the master is writable. And we can see that our replication has worked because we can say slave.get and return the value from the slave. So we can read from slaves and write to masters. Now we know our master is red as zero. So let's go ahead and simulate failure by going back into another terminal and stopping the current master. So we're going to say docker rm minus f stop red as zero and that will trigger a failover by the sentinels. Back in our Python application, we can again try to set a new value, this time set foo to bar two. If we do that, we can see that it worked. This is because failover has triggered and there is a new master now. And if I do slave.get, we can see the new value. And if we do sentinel.discoverMaster, we can see that we have a new master address. And to recover from failure, I can just go ahead and start up Redis 0 again. And that will join it back to the cluster as a slave. If I do sentinel.discover slaves in my development container, we can see we now have two slaves again. So that is very simple. We can see that from our application perspective, all we need to do is retry in case there's a Redis connection failure. The Redis library will automatically get the connection for the new master and be able to continue writing. So now we've seen some example code. So let's go ahead and plug Redis into our application. So now the first thing we need to do to connect our application to Redis is read some environment variables of passing in the Redis connection string. So to do that, I'm going to import OS, which allows us to read and write environment variables. And I'm going to set three environment variables, one for the Sentinel address, the master name and the Redis password. That's everything we need to establish connection to the Sentinel. So right at the top of my application, I'm going to go ahead and set those values. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to exit out of my dev environment because now I want to inject those environment variables into our container. So if we take a look at our docker run command, we're going to run exactly the same command, say docker run IT, pass in that port, run it on the Redis network, mount in our source code. But this time I'm going to add three environment variables. We're going to add the credentials, the master, the name of the Redis, as well as the three Sentinel addresses. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this, paste it to the terminal, and now I'm in our application. I'm going to change directory to the Python introduction part five folder, and I'm going to reinstall all our dependencies again, since we've exited the container. So I'm going to say pip install, and now we can go ahead and set up our client. So first things first, what we're going to do is take that Redis library and import the Sentinel library. So I'm going to go ahead and put that import statement at the top and then we're going to go ahead and create an array of sentinels since we have more than one. So what I'm going to do is create a blank array and since we're reading the sentinel addresses in an environment variable as a comma delimited string, I'm going to go ahead and split that. So I'm going to say 4s 
in redis sentinels dot split split it by comma and then append to our array the addresses go ahead and put that just below our array and now that we have an array of addresses we can go ahead and use that so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say redis sentinel equals and i'm going to use the sentinel library to pass in our addresses and this will create a new sentinel client and then i'm going to run the same logic we did earlier by creating a client of the master so we can write to redis by querying the sentinel so to do that i say redis master equals redis sentinel which is our client we created over here and i say master for pass in the master name from the environment variable and pass in the password from the environment variable as well so now that we have a redis client we can start talking to redis but we've noticed that when the redis master is down we need some retry logic so let's create a universal function that runs redis commands that also supports retry logic we can then go ahead and use this redis function to talk to redis and then use that to store customer data and to retrieve customer data from redis so what i'm going to do is at the very top here i'm going to create a new New function and this function is going to call redis command and it's going to take in a command followed by some arguments it will then run that command to redis and return the result then what i'm going to do is set a max retry count so let's say we want to retry three times we're going to start with the count being zero and what we'll do is we'll put an exponential back off of five seconds this means every time there's a connection failure we'll wait five seconds before retrying so what we're going to do now is implement a simple loop by saying while true then we're going to say try and in this try block we're going to try to connect to redis and catch any redis connection failures so this is very simple in the try block all we do is say return command and we run that command and pass in the arguments and then what will happen is if there's any failures we'll catch the exception by saying accept and we'll catch specifically a redis.connection error or a timeout error and when that exception happens we'll increase the counter and if the counter has run out we will go ahead and raise that exception so we'll say raise which will re-raise the exception otherwise we'll go ahead and print out a message saying that we're going to retry in five seconds and add a sleep to say sleep for five seconds so that is our simple command which will run redis commands with retry logic now if we scroll down back to our application where we've created a connection we can use that command and connection to test out whether we can read or write to redis so what i'm going to do is call a simple print function and in the print function i'm going to run our function i'm going to print the output so i'm going to say redis command pass in the command i want to run which is master.set and set a value called foo and set the value to bar. And once I've set the value, I can then run the same command again, but this time say master.get and read the value. We can then go ahead and test our application by firstly setting our flask environment variable, then saying flask run as we did before. And now notice that we've written to Redis and we've got the value back. So our read and write works. Now we can simulate failure by finding and storing stopping the current master. Now we know the master is not read as zero. To find the master, we can open up another terminal. We can exec into the sentinel by saying docker exec minus it, go in sentinel zero and connect to the sentinel by saying read a CLI on port 5000 and run the command sentinel master my master. This will discover the latest master, which is this IP address, which ends in three. So we need to go ahead and find this container, which will reveal which container is the current master so what i'm going to do is exit out of this and exit out of the sentinel container we can run docker ps and it's possibly one of these two so what i'm going to do is say docker inspect followed by the container id and we can see the ip address ends in four so it's definitely not redis 2 it must be redis 1 if i run docker inspect on redis 1 we can see that the ip address ends in 03 so i can say docker rm minus f and i can go ahead and stop redis 1 which will trigger a failover and then in our application we can rerun the command and notice that it's continuing to work so now i'm going to go ahead and clean up redis by connecting to the new master 
and running the flush all command. This will go ahead and clear out the data from Redis. So now that we have the hang of Redis, we have our application connected to Redis and we have a function that can read and write to Redis with retry logic. Let's go ahead and use this function and plug it into our customer logic so we can read and write customer data to our Redis database. So to do this, we need to take a look at all our customer functions. We're firstly going to take a look at the get customer function that takes in an ID and gets the customer from Redis. And what we're going to do is use the customer ID as a key in Redis. So this function is very simple. Let's expand the function. Now, instead of getting all the customers from a file, we can go ahead and remove that. And we can simply get a single customer by passing in the customer ID as a key. So to do this, we say customer equals, we're going to run a Redis command. This is our function we created earlier. And the command is very simple. All we do is say Redis master dot get, and we pass in the customer ID that's received by our function. And that's as simple as that. It'll return a customer back. Then we need to ensure that the customer was actually found. Now, what I'm going to do is remove this logic that we had here. And basically, if a record doesn't exist in Redis, Redis returns an enum called none. So we need to check for that. So if customer equals none, then we're simply going to go ahead and return an empty customer object. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to need to convert that customer back to a string and return it as JSON data. So what I'm going to do is create a new string called C. I'm just going to use the string function in Python to pass in the customer, return a string, and then use our popular JSON.loads function to return a JSON object back. So now our get customer function takes in an ID, gets the customer from Redis, returns an empty object if it's not found, or returns the object in JSON format if it is found. So this is an efficient way of returning one record from Redis. Now we can use this function to update our get customers function. So let's go ahead and expand that one. And now we're not going to be reading from a file. So I'm going to go ahead and remove this logic. And what I'm going to do is create an empty customers object to start with. And I'm going to get all the customer IDs from Redis by saying customer IDs. And I'm going to run a Redis command. And I'm going to say Redis master dot scan star. This is going to return all the customer IDs, all the keys inside of Redis. And then what I'm going to do is run a loop on that. So I'm going to take every key that I returned, call our get customer function, pass in the customer ID. This will return the customer object from Redis. And I'm going to go ahead and assign it to that list of customers. And once I'm done looping, I'm simply going to return that list of customers. Now note that we don't have a function to update a single customer. So let's go ahead and create that. So I'm going to create a new function called update customer, which takes in a customer object and updating an item in Redis is very simple. All I'm going to do is run a Redis command. And in this command, I'm going to run Redis master dot set because I want to set a new record. And when you run set, you have to pass in the key. So what I'm going to do is pass in the key. And in this case, it's going to be customer dot customer ID. The ID is the key followed by the value. And the value is going to be a JSON dump of that customer. So just like we did in part three, of our series, we're going to convert the item to a JSON object by saying JSON.dumps pass in the customer and get the dictionary out of it. So this function will write the JSON data to Redis using the customer ID as a key. Now, finally, we can go ahead and update our update customers function, which no longer needs to write to a file. So I'm going to go ahead and remove this logic. And all we need to do here is write a loop to say for every customer in customers, take the customers that we passed in and go ahead. And for each of those customers, update our customers. So we're going to call the update function and that's going to go ahead and write each customer to Redis. So now we have our customer functions ready to go. We can read and write customers. Next up, we're going to go ahead and delete these test commands that we created earlier. So now we have to go through our endpoints and make sure that they're up to date because now our customer functions will be reading from Redis. So our get customers endpoint is still the same. It's going to be at the root of the web server. It's going to support get. It's going to call our get customers function, which is going to read all the records from Redis and then use JSON.dumps to return the JSON back to the client. And then we have an endpoint for getting a single customer, which is slash get slash customer ID. That's going to go ahead and call our get customer function, pass in the customer ID, get it back if that object is blank, return a 404, otherwise return the customer. And then we finally take a look at our set endpoint, which is to post a customer, which will call
call our add customer function. This will go ahead and read the JSON data, validate the fields to make sure they're all there. Now, instead of getting all the customers, which is pretty inefficient, we don't need to do that anymore. We can go ahead and remove that. And we can simply go ahead and define a new customer by passing in our fields, such as customer ID, first name, and last name. And then we can call the update customer function, which will go ahead and write that customer record to Redis. And then we follow that by returning success with a 200 status code. And now that we have all our functions up to date, we can go ahead and expand our Docker file to install all our dependencies. So far, we've just used the Docker file as a dev environment, but we need to create a production image that we can go ahead and deploy. So what I'm going to do is create a new layer from the dev layer, and I'm going to call this one runtime. I'm going to set my working directory to slash app. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to copy the requirements.txt into the slash app folder, and I'm going to go ahead and run pip install. Once I have my dependencies installed, I'm going to copy my source code into the container. So I'm going to say copy, copy the app.py file into the working directory of the container. Then I'm going to set that environment variable in order for Flask to find our application. And I'm going to run a command saying Flask run bind to 0, .0, 0.0.0 and expose port 5000. And then what I can do is I can go ahead and exit out of our Docker container, change directory into our Python introduction part five folder. And to build a container, it's really simple. All I do is say docker build dot minus T, and I'm going to call this my customer app. I'm going to go ahead and run this. This will build our Docker container, which we can then use to run locally or in Kubernetes. Now to run our container, it's very simple. We're going to say Docker run minus IT. So we can see the logs interactively. We're going to expose port 5000 so we can access our endpoint. We're going to run our application on the Redis network, pass in our Redis environment variables in order for it to connect and our container image name, which is called customer app. Go ahead and copy this, paste it to the terminal, and this will start Start up our application. And now if we access our application over port 5000, we can see that we have no customers in our database. So let's go ahead and test that by creating a new customer by using an application such as Postman. We can say I want to run a post method command to localhost 5000 and we're going to call our set endpoint and we're going to pass in the body our JSON object of our customer. Go ahead and click send and we can see that got a success back. And if we go to our endpoint again and we refresh, we now have our customer in the database. So this is storing our customer in Redis. Now, if you're new to Redis, be sure to check out the link down below to my Redis for beginners guide. And I hope this video helped you understand the basics of reading and writing to Redis and connecting an application to a database. Now, if you like the video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe and hit the bell. And let me know down in the comments below what sort of videos you'd like me to cover in the future. And if you want to support the channel even further, be sure to check the Patreon link down below or hit the join button to become a YouTube member. And as always, thanks for watching and until next time, peace.